we are live. Welcome to O3's Scorched Review and Thoughts film. I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that idea of the video is fairly comparatively short, at least that's the idea. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. Now, I start this video with a review with either zero spoilers, if I do spoil anything, I'll verbally warn before I do so, and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler. So you can skip a mute and skip ahead until you see me go on my index finger. As soon as I end the video itself, I will get into the thoughts section. And for the rest of the video, I will be spoiling the movie, including the ending of the movie. Now. Yeah, so I'm aware that not that many people know or care about this movie. And yeah, I'm reviewing it because I still care. I'm not necessarily saying that I have some incredible new revelation to share. I'm reviewing it because I like reviewing and it's something I wanted to review. Now, I have watched this three times, including just before I started recording. So, plot. The setting, a small desert town, a bank everyone is working at and hates working at. The situation, several of the people working there and their friends, three groups, independent of one another, in their response to hating working there, decide that, I don't know, maybe the bank has more money that it needs to, they want to get even and make bank. So if this is something you've never heard of, you're not alone. This is a comedy crime from 2003 directed by Gavin Grazer and the concept is a farcical quirky comedy where multiple people attempt robbing the same bank at the same time without coordinating it with each other and you know I'm not going to give away whether or not but we wonder are they going to, you know, run into each other as they try? They are trying to rob different parts of the bank, so maybe not. And it's working with an ensemble cast. I'm not sure this exact thing has been done, but there are ensemble heist movies out there that I don't know about. Was it worth making... Probably not. You know, it's 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 fine, but it's not. I'm not reviewing this because I love the movie. Nobody's making me re review it. I'm in. I'm intentionally reviewing it, but it's not because I love the movie. The main reason, the thing I really wanted to talk about, why I'm doing a video about this movie at all, is because the movie is in part about how, yeah, probably, yeah, really mainly about it. It's really driven by that in this movie and in general, a lot of American workers hate their job and hate their boss. And the idea of this movie is that since the, since the characters in the movie also hate their job and their boss, you know, the, the viewer can vicariously live out the fantasy of getting revenge over their their boss and how bad their job is by robbing the the their boss you know by by taking money from the place that they work becoming rich very suddenly even if it means stealing i guess just in case i should start by saying I don't think this movie gave anyone the idea that it was okay to rob a bank. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, media does have a certain impact on our perceptions of things, but it's not going to make someone go out there and rob a bank just because they saw it in a movie. I myself would never steal. I suppose it would be morally defensible to steal if it was to feed my starving family, unless I put something on the toast, like jam. I'm not stealing toast. 
We are clearly meant to empathize with the workers. They're made to be very sympathetic. You fully understand why they want to steal. And since the plans are involved and clever rather than just, say, a holdup, which could also really traumatize the bank tellers, we do kind of, at the very least, want to see if it works because it's kind of impressive. And the plans do sound somewhat like they would work in real life. I mean, other than the fact that in real life there would be active security cameras, a character at one point tells us that the cameras only start recording if the alarm goes off, but I don't think that's actually how that kind of thing works in real life, but if, you know, it's, it's one of those things of like, well, then there just wouldn't be a movie, you know. Now, let's see. But, but yeah, if the security cameras inside the bank were active, that would immediately mean that their plans don't work. But yeah, the, the, we, we are meant to empathize with the, the working man characters. And we certainly do have a certain degree of empathy for them. We're never asked to empathize with the rich characters. There is a little bit of dialogue between characters that say that rich people can't have gotten rich without exploiting people. And while that is true, absolutely, 100%, I mean, if you didn't screw someone over to become rich, you inherited your wealth and one of your ancestors screwed someone over to become rich. It is impossible to become extremely rich by yourself unless it's like several generations in a row where you work extremely hard. Almost everyone who is rich either inherited it or screwed someone over to have the money. And this is where I get to. I'm not a communist. I'm a social democrat, but I do believe, yeah, I am just going to, I think that is enough for me to say about that. I would not personally say that stealing is okay just because the people you steal from don't deserve that money. Ideally, we raise taxes on the rich and improve, improve conditions for the poor. And we do meet a few rich people who treat people without power very badly. I, I don't think there's a single character who has power who doesn't treat other people badly. There's actually, yeah, it, it's, I, I don't think there is, yeah. But the movie doesn't dive deep into this idea. It's just an idea that the movie brings up to help justify the stealing. But yeah, we're meant to empathize with them despite the fact that they are stealing. It's meant to feel cathartic. It's still the American dream if you got the money by stealing, according to this film and some of the characters in the excellent and underrated movie, which I also did a video on a little while back, A Simple Plan, and many people in real life. The movie also goes into how the, the, the typical American worker is alienated from their work. They can't see their work making a difference. They can't see the fruits of their labor the way that, for example, a farmer can. And the alienation is so immense that one of the nicest characters in this movie, their first response to someone saying that they became a fireman to help people, the character laughs and says, yeah, right. Because they simply can't imagine someone, f someone else actually finding meaning in their work because they themselves so thoroughly do not. And of course, the gap between rich and poor has only gotten worse in the years, the nearly two decades that have passed between this movie coming out and me making this video. Yes, I am aware that I do videos on a lot of older movies, include, or not older, but I don't cover that much very recent stuff. I do go for stuff that's been out for a while, including when no one actually knows the movie that I'm talking about. I'm okay with that. Rich people and politicians continue to find new ways to show just how little empathy or regard they have for people who don't have wealth and power. And in many cases, they seem to resent them. Like politicians, the way they talk about voters, you get the sense that they basically feel like, you know, well, we have to trick these people into voting for us every two or four years. But 
man, it would be so much easier if we didn't have to convince voters because they know that they're not going to do the things that they tell the voters they're going to do. And the rich people barely even pretend that they actually think that regular people should get, you know, should the things should get better for them. You know, I forget, was it, a, was it maybe two years ago or something? I think it was tax cuts for the rich. And there was an American media personality. Was it maybe Dave Rubin? He does tend to really put his foot in his mouth and try to get other conservatives. Please stop pretending you're not a conservative, Dave Rubin. He, he tries to get them to say, ah, I mean, you bake a cake for me even though I'm gay. And the other guy goes like, no, I wouldn't. I think it was him who asked a rich person, these tax cuts are really going to mean that regular people that work for you are going to have it better. I don't remember exactly how he felt. Maybe that the, mo the money would be like, maybe would mean that some of the people working there would get more stock or something. But the rich person didn't even pretend. He was, he was almost like surprised. Am, am I supposed to pretend that I care about poor people? Like, if they, if I work them so hard and pay them so little that eventually they become homeless, there are millions of other Americans who I can push into working themselves to death for less than a living wage. I don't have, this money is for me. Tax cuts are so I can buy a bigger boat and another house so I can show off for other rich people. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I realize that there are countless Americans who wouldn't call it the American dream when it requires stealing. But enough Americans do feel that it is for this movie to get made and not immediately removed from theaters in response to it being deemed incredibly offensive, which is something that has happened to some movies. Some U.S. towns banned Life of Brian, and that movie in no way says that it's okay to steal the American dream. I mean, if you're the thing about it, that movie isn't even really criticizing Jesus. It's criticizing his early followers, and I suppose you could... Maybe his followers in general, but it's not saying that Jesus himself... I, I mean, that movie does explicitly say, yeah, Jesus existed, he was the Son of God, but every so often, people who, who were looking for Jesus mistook Brian... For Jesus and they ended up thinking some really silly things based on things that he did that some of the time he didn't even mean to do you know but that was enough to be deemed blasphemous of the 31 IMDb user reviews only one person even brings up the ethical implications and none of the six external reviews or uh, let's see Reviews that I found on the internet by going to IMDb and going to its external reviews section. I will give more detail on this in the spoiler section titled Notes Taken Before Watching. But yeah, I, you could probably already tell the reason I'm doing a video on this movie is the, the yeah, I care greatly. I care very deeply about how the working, excuse me how working people are treated in America by their boss and by politicians and such. And yeah, this the when I the last time I watched this movie, I was struck by how much like it really it barely seems to feel the need to justify why it would be okay for these people to steal. You know, it's, and, and with at least one of the, at least one of the cases, they're trying to steal from a person that we know, we, we know their name, we see their face, we see what they do. You know, we, we get, we're, we're privy to, to some, you know, some, some moments where they, you know, they basically, they behave as the, as though no one's watching them. You know, and the movie is still convinced that we're gonna be on the side of the person 
or people stealing, but not the person or pe people, people that the money is being stolen from. And, and again, I get, obviously part of it is they're rich. So, you know, you know, even if you empty the bank, the rich people would still have money. But it's still just, it really struck me how, I, sh I should say, I'm not American myself. I have been fascinated with America since childhood. And, yeah, it just, it really struck me. I've seen many movies where the goal for the main characters is to become rich. But this is one of the only ones where it is so, so brazen and and just i mean some of the people that are trying to to steal they're not like you know the um let's see what's a what's a what's an excuse me name or description of someone that's like always virtuous mother teresa i guess they're not exactly Mother Teresa. Some of them really are kind of sketchy people. Like, they've done things or think things that are kind of messed up. But the movie is still so convinced. Like, the movie doesn't stop every so often and, like, check. Are, is, is everyone in the audience still okay with this? Do I need to justify? Oh, no, never mind. It's, it's fine. No, it's, it seems to just, like, the people who made this movie... I realize I'm anthropomorphizing the movie. It's it's a joke. The people who made this movie seem convinced they could make a 90-minute movie where just a little bit of justification early in the movie would mean that the audience would be invest would, would be on their side for the entire rest of the movie. It's not a long movie, but still, that we wouldn't like I've seen movies that bring up really unethical things, but a lot of those movies will tend to end very soon after so that the the credits start rolling before people stop and go like, that's not okay, you can't do that, you know, and it's, I'm not saying, there are plenty of movies out there where you're not supposed to empathize with the protagonists, where you're not supposed to think that what you're seeing being done is okay. But this is one of those. We're we're supposed to cheer for them and and be like really like when they're like nervous about getting caught. We're supposed to we're not supposed to be like, yeah, you you you're gonna be caught and it's good. We're we're supposed to be like on the edge of our seat and be like, oh I hope they make it, you know. Now I'm not saying that the movie is smart as such, but you do have to pay close attention to keep up with the robbery attempts, and the very start of the movie shows some of the outcome, and then it goes back a few days before showing what actually happened, and, you know, some of the characters in the, in the, yeah, that we see at the start, after what happened, they are in a certain condition or situation that, you know, when, when it then flashes, you know, yeah, when it jumps back and the rest of the movie plays out, they're not in that same situation. So we, you know, we're, we're sitting there wondering how exactly, you know, how that happened. And over the course of the film, we see it. You may, for example, want to note if anyone has a mark on their face when the movie starts. Now, this was written by, I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm just going to try Joe Wein, W-E-I-N. And he hasn't written any other movie, and I'm not sure he's written anything other than movies either. I think he did a pretty decent job. I, you know, if he did, like, excuse me. If they put a movie in theaters that was a heist movie that he had written, I'd have to consider it. I would just hope that they didn't try to make it funny because this isn't that funny of a movie. Like I, I think if they had played it fairly straight, if they, if it had been like gritty and and dark, I think that might have worked better because the best stuff in this movie, the best written stuff certainly, 
is the details of the how how they're stealing and exactly why and just yeah a, a lot of the humor really falls very flat a lot of the gags don't land at all or land with a thud now the movie handles plot twists pretty decently there are a lot of unexpected occurrences I would say it gets close to there being too many twists, but it doesn't quite get there. And the direction is fairly focused. And yeah, so the director was Gavin Grazer, who's only directed two other feature films. I've never heard of them, so I can't really see, like, he's actually most known as an actor. I personally haven't seen him in much. He's in Frost Nixon and Wayne's World 2. I, I would say that he basically, like the way he handles the robberies themselves, shows that he did understand how to, like, there are some, some of the, some of the stealing is intercut and some of the, yeah, like you, you get, you're told the details and like the way it's filmed and edited, you never really lose track of any of the robbery attempts. And I, I would like for the director and writer to make a spiritual successor to this movie. It is kind of impressive. Not an actual sequel, that would be pretty silly, but yeah, you know. And, yeah, so the opening, like, the very first thing is the, the opening credits. And it's this decently stylized, like, one of the names of the leads is on a tattoo. One of the names is on a road sign. Road sign? Is that what they're called? Anyway, I think you know what I mean. I think one of them is, like, maybe on the... the pavement itself. I, I forget, but yeah. And then there's this short sequence that kind of does a decent job of, of setting up how you're going to... I'm not going to give away exactly what happens, but basically there's a sequence that it's, it's well shot and you can understand what you're seeing. And it goes on for maybe a minute and then near the end there's kind of a joke. And I think you you get the sense this is I'm supposed to laugh at that am I not? But you aren't really. You're st I mean occasionally the movie is funny. It's not as unfunny as the opening is, but yeah. And then you very briefly see the you know some of what it looked like after the robbery attempts, and then it goes back several days, and we see you know, the, the various things that happened leading up to that. And, yeah, you know, the fact that you immediately see at least some of the outcome definitely does grab your attention. And I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or sad ending, but it's appropriate to what came before, and it does wrap up everything. And the movie doesn't really lose your interest along the way. Like I said, it's not particularly funny, but if you can live with that, if you're just, if you just kind of want to see how the robbery attempts work out, you know, yeah, for that it, it works. Now, the, let's see. So, excuse me, I am just going to skim through this real quick. And, huh, here we go, yeah. So, Marcus Thomas plays Carter Dolman, Schmally's roommate, and he's a little bit, he's, he's not the brightest bulb. There's, there's a montage of him going to job interviews, and he is just not very good at convincing potential employers to hire him. Alicia Silverstone plays Sheila Rilo, a bank teller, and Rick's girlfriend. She's very sympathetic. No one can stand Rick. I've seen several people say that 
she doesn't make this performance distinct enough from the one she gives in Clueless. I haven't watched Clueless, but I have seen enough clips to know that that's basically true. And it's, I mean, she's not given a whole lot to work with. I like her in other stuff. I, she's, she's fine in this, you know. Rachel Lake Cook plays Schmally, a clothing store employee at Carter's roommate. She is helpful. She can she's can be somewhat quick to anger. She likes to imagine herself wearing a Xena costume and getting revenge on obnoxious employers with swords, throwing knives, and that kind of thing. And that's that's definitely memorable. I'm not sure I would necessarily call it funny. It's cathartic. For sure. And Woody Harrelson plays Jason Woods Valley, assistant manager and nature lover. He's very, very sweet natured. He's given several bits of physical comedy and he certainly does try to make it work. I'm just not sure I would quite say that it does work. And it's really too bad. Woody Harrelson is really, I, I like him a lot and he can be very, very funny, but I think. I'm not sure I would say this really plays to his strengths all that much. And John Cleese plays Charles Merchant, local businessman and millionaire, creator of infomercials. He's incredibly obnoxious, which if you know John Cleese at all, you know he can do in his sleep. But they don't give him a lot of interesting things to do, which is too bad because he is incredibly talented. But then that goes for a lot of the cast of this movie. They do give him, like, there are a couple of things that, like, years down the line you're still going to be able to remember him and some of the other cast were in this but like there are some he's excuse me in the past he's had roles further in the past i mean he's had roles where it's like you are he is constantly making you laugh and like everything he says and does is incredibly funny and memorable Paula Costanzo plays Stuart Stu Stein, a bank teller and Max's friend who's desperate for excitement. He's very nervous, but also very smart, and he's like, he, he, yeah, I think that might be about what I should say about him. He sometimes loans Max money, and Max is not that great at paying him back and because of that Stu you know he gets kind of frustrated with uh, keep with all these loans that he's not paying back I'm not gonna lie a big part of the reason that I even got this movie when I first saw that it was on sale was Paula Costanzo I love him in I can't believe I'm writing down the name of the movie excuse me I swear, it. I will remember it in a few seconds. Road Trip. And I've been meaning, I've, I've been trying to find other movies where he's really funny. And he's nowhere near as funny in this as he is in that. But I, you know, I wasn't unhappy with my purchase. But, yeah. And David Crumholtz plays Max, Stu's friend, full of get-rich-quick schemes. His enthusiasm is infectious. I'm not especially a fan of his roles once he came of age. I mean, I loathed him in You Stupid Man, but I do really love him in Adam's Family Matters. But yeah, he's like... His... What, what's that saying? His reach exceeds his grasp or something like that? You know, he wishes he was rich, but he's not really... He's, yeah, he, he keeps coming up with these get-rich-quick schemes. And Joshua Leonard plays Rick Becker, bank manager and Sheila's boyfriend. We love to hate this guy, pure sleaze, and the actor nails it. The very first thing you see him do is fire someone who doesn't even remotely deserve it. Like, just right off the bat. is yeah. And I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce this. I hope, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I really like him. Ivan Sergei plays Mark, a fireman, and Sheila's new love interest. He's kind of the straight man. There's a lot of crazy going on right around him. Yeah, he, he does a fairly decent job. 
and Jeffrey Tambor as the bank employer. He's amusing. They don't give him a lot to do. And, yeah. They work hard to make every character quirky, and it does get excessive. The chemistry is pretty good. Like, you believe that Stu and Max are friends. You believe that Sheila can't stand Rick, and that he... Rick doesn't understand how much of a jerk he is when he talks to her. The... The actors tend to be convincing in their roles. They're well cast. I, again, I, I... This doesn't really know how to use someone like Woody Harrelson, but largely it's well cast. And... You know, the a lot of the characters don't get an awful lot of screen time since there's so many characters, but it does a decent job of showing some of the characters in tremendously varied circumstances. You see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. Excuse me. And excuse me, the the DP really understood how to make it best work. I mean, it's nothing mind-blowing, but it does actually manage to keep you up to date on the stealing and you know, the like many other heist movies, it's one of the ones where there are there's at least one scene of a person who knows how it could be done explaining verbally how you know, why this could work and exactly how to approach it. And instead of us just looking at the person, you know, the camera doesn't just show us the person talking, the camera shows us, you know, for example, okay, we're going to get into the vault. And then, you know, the camera will show where is the vault? What does it look like? What does it look? How do you open it? These kinds of things. And the editing also does a good job at keeping the movie from getting confusing. There are a lot of plot lines. The movie doesn't really have special effects. There are some stunts, and they work pretty well. You know, I already mentioned the physical comedy. That's, yeah. Excuse me. And the production design is perfectly serviceable. You know, the, the bank feels like a real place, even though, you know, it's very possible that in, in real life it's just a set or it's not actually a bank but something else. You know, things like that. And the various, you know, you, you meet some of the some of the characters. You see where they live, how they live. And, yeah, it, it feels real. And you see the living arrangements of at least one rich character as well. And, again, it feels like, okay, this is where that kind of person would live, how they would live. And some of the aspects of the bank robbing is tense and suspenseful, and at times, the, you know, yeah, at, at times it gets very complicated, but without you really losing track. And, yeah, so the villains are Rick and Mr. Merchant. I think that's where I'm going. Yeah, and the protagonist. Excuse me. Yeah, the the protagonists are compelling. The villains are compelling, and the relationships that the protagonists have with their respective villains works pretty well. You know, it's you can really understand why they want to to steal. And. Yeah, the, there are, you know, scenes in this where characters, without knowing it, are relatively close to each other and are trying to do similar things, such as robbing the bank. And you wonder if they're actually going to notice each other and how things might play out if they do, especially since none of them should be there, should be doing what they're doing, so you don't know who's going to take charge of the situation. Like, if one of the poor people robs one of the rich people at the rich person's house, it's like, oh, the rich person's gonna try to, you know, 
keep them in the house until the cops get there. But if they discover each other robbing the bank, who's going to take charge? You know, it makes you wonder. And the music is quirky and lighthearted. The comedy includes blue, character, cringe, deadpan, physical, surreal, and wit. It's fairly rarely laugh out loud funny, and a bunch of the time the screen, the, the, the stuff that's on screen, is just kind of quirky, maybe weird, but not especially funny. This, like, if you, if you are watching this video and you're not sure if you're gonna want to watch the movie yet, don't watch it expecting it to be funny. It's, it's not particularly funny. But if you like the idea of these, you know, multiple heists going on at the same time, and you can live with a comedy that's aggressively quirky and not that frequently all that funny, then you might enjoy it. I haven't really seen that many movies that are very similar to this, so I can't really get into that. Now, this is a mild PG-13, and other than some animal abuse, which is played for laughs, and some racism, it's not, you know, it's not a very risque movie. And, yeah, the tone is light, and, like, as far as realism goes, there are a number of things in this that would not happen the same way in real life, you know, but they're, like, the, the, ah, what's the word? It's, it's comic exaggeration, basically, with, without comedy, without it being that funny. But yeah, you definitely need to su suspend disbelief, but, you know, it's not a, a big problem. There's a pretty, de as far as painting goes, there's a pretty decent energy to the film. I know some people think it takes a special talent to make a movie that is 90 minutes be boring, but you'd actually be surprised. For some movies, it is very difficult to keep the viewer's attention for 90 minutes. This one does fine. You're not super invested, but you do kind of want to see how it all ends up. And you know, if you start watching the movie and you know that it's only 90 minutes, like, if you watch the first 20 or 30 minutes of this movie and you don't know if it's 90 minutes or three hours, you might really get frustrated. But, you know, yeah, it's it's just around 90 minutes long. If you inc include the credits, it's an hour, 30 minutes and 30 seconds. Is it worth the investment of time? Probably not at most only just barely and yeah if you're not really interested 20 or 30 minutes in the movie probably isn't your kind of thing you know again like maybe watch it just once but if you're not extremely excited about it as you're you know if half an hour in you don't you're not like I can't live the rest of my life never knowing how Scorched ends. You know, go ahead and watch the last hour. But if that isn't how you feel, if you're kind of bored, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure the movie's really going to do anything to convince you otherwise. Now. Right, ratings-wise, there is a little bit of harsh language, but it's not super aggressive the way, yeah. Now, the best element, it is legitimately kind of impressive that the movie manages to plot out the multiple bank robbery attempts. I'm not going to give away whether or not any of them succeed, but I will tell you, the movie never just gives up on one of the plot lines. All of them, every single last one, are resolved by the end of the movie. Now the worst aspect, the quirk is strong in this one. The movie's, like, yeah, I, I, I keep bringing up, the movie's never all that funny, and, like, there are points where you wonder if it's even trying, or if they just wrote all these bank robbery plot lines and realized they couldn't sell this as a series Ocean's Eleven kind of thing, so they had to try to 
at jokes half heartedly. I mean, I think this movie is making fun of people who are into DMT. Because, as you might have realized, this movie was made in the before times, back when that was considered like nerdy and really ridiculous and out there. But the jokes, if I can even call them that, are so half hearted. I mean, they barely even go beyond just representation. Like, you see some of the characters playing DD, and I guess that we're supposed to find it funny. But it kind of just sounds like they're playing DD, and maybe some of them are trying to convince the DM to go with something they're trying. And he's kind of resistant to it. I honestly have a hard time believing that they would have even registered as jokes at the time. You know, I remember watching movies in 2003. I remember what we found funny back then. I'm not sure this was ever... Actually, yeah, come to think of it. When I first watched this, I didn't know very much about D&D. And even back then, I did not find it funny. I mean, I'm not into D&D &D and role-playing in general today, but I do realize that it's a thing that exists. It's not inherently funny. I mean, seriously, the movie just kind of presents D&D &D if, as if it's inherently funny. Like, there's a, yeah, like one of the players is saying, no, but my stats are this. And the, and the dungeon master, like, you really have stats like that? And it's like, it sounds like it's written by someone who has no, who just knows that D and D is a thing, and stats in D and D are a thing, and that sometimes the DM and the and and some of the player characters will get into arguments about if something should work or not. But it's not; it's barely a joke, and there's not really anything you can do to. Uh, I don't know, I guess you could try to mentally prepare yourself for the aggressive quirkiness, for how little of the movie is actually funny. And yeah, so the first time I watched it, I was most worried that it wouldn't be all that funny. And sadly, the movie lived down to my expectations. I was most looking forward to the cast, since I like all of them in other stuff, and I wanted to see more. And let's see. yeah, I already mentioned the movies on sale. And Paul Costanzo, I love him. Road Trip. I want to see more of him. I I'm not sure there's a single actor in this that I haven't seen else. Possibly the guy who plays Rick. But all of them I've seen in other stuff, and I like them in at least some of what I've seen them in. And yeah, I mean, I had a fun enough time watching the cast. I, I usually don't buy something based on the cast. I buy it based on the people who, you know, for example, directed it or wrote it. But yeah. And yeah, basically everyone in the cast has done much better elsewhere. Is it entertaining to watch? As long as you aren't expecting it to be funny, if you just want to see the bank robbery plot lines, then yes. Is it good or not? It is technically competent, but otherwise not really a good movie. Like, it's not, like, aggressively awful. Like, I've heard some people say the worst thing, the worst movie to watch, the worst kind of movie to watch is a failed comedy. I'm not sure that I would, that, that I find that true for myself, but sure, for sure, a failed comedy can be very painful. I wouldn't say that this is that kind of thing, because a lot of the time it's barely even trying to be funny. Like, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's like, just, water cooler talk level, kind of, it's not funny, but it's just, oh yeah, I know the people involved in this, I'm standing at the water cooler talking to one of my coworkers, and he's talking, he's telling me a story that he knows, and it's not that good of a story, but it's a person I know. And I'm here, you know, it's it's not going to take that long, sure. And then occasionally the story gets really involving because it's about people robbing a bank, you know. I recommend this most to people who like parallel plot lines and fans of the cast. The Tomato Meter. This has a 17%. 
based on six reviews, and the audience score is 46% based on 5,000 plus ratings. And yeah, I, I can understand why they, you know, I'm basically grading on a curve. That's why I'm not trashing every single aspect of this. But if you're not grading on a curve, if you talk about every single aspect of the movie, yeah, ultimately it doesn't really. On IMDb, it's, oh right, and Metacritic didn't have it at all. It's that so few people care about it that it's not even on Metacritic. IMDb, it has a 6.0. And let's see, that is, yeah, 27% percent of the voters voted six, twenty-two percent voted seven, and yeah, not very many people voted it higher than that. And yeah, so yeah, let's see. I I give this six comedy robberies out of ten, and yeah, it's it's I'm not unhappy that I bought it. I'm not unhappy that I watched it. I'm not unhappy that I'm making this video. Sometimes that doesn't come across as strongly. This is where we get into spoilers and the thoughts section. So the first thought section entitled Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice with the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during the section once I get into the video, the thoughts section, the rest of the thoughts section itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So yeah, from here on out. No warnings for when I spoil this movie. I will warn if I'm going to spoil anything else. And again, hold up the index finger. This video is not going to contain clips of any kind. The most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the subject in another tab. I won't mind. Since we are still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, I think I already have. It's possible that I will touch my face. I want to reassure you, I wash my hands since going since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, let's see, yeah, content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing potentially triggering content of this movie, racism and animal abuse play for laughs, especially play for laughs. Now, let's see, I don't... Yeah, I just want to briefly say, I don't have a problem with violence in fiction. It's, uh, you know, it's only because some of it in, in this is animal abuse. And, let's see. I might swear a little in this video. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, I got this on sale. So, anything negative I say in this is not out of bitterness. I also don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I send this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, let's see. Yeah, instead of me quoting all the lines from this movie that I... I yeah, I don't think I marked any of these as something I had to anything to say about. But yeah, the the IMDb memorable quote section, like I think based on what I said in the review, you can probably tell which ones I thought were great and which ones I really didn't like. I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here and act out the the ones that yeah, whether I like them or not, and. So, yeah, I, I started recording as soon as I got to the computer after watching, and yeah, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. 
some of these analysis, some of these MSC3 refraction other jokes. Now, the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The first section is the stuff that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or like. The second section is thoughts that I had before watching, including uh, anyway. And the final section, I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Ron Tomatoes, Metacritic, MVP, and Wikipedia. And that. Right, so. Yeah, sometimes I bring up whether or not the movie appears to have empathy for the least likable characters. And whether I think they made the right choice. It definitely doesn't have empathy for Rick, Mr. Merchant. I think an argument could be made that, yeah, and, and the um, Schmally's boss at the clothing store, Dolman's former boss at the ice cream place. Ah, uh, let's see. I think an argument could be made that the bank manager, bank director, Jeffrey Tambor, is also not really showing any empathy, and the, maybe also the the yeah the people that um, Dolman goes to. Uh, what's it called? He um, goes to interview for job interviews for. Do I think they made the right choice? I think the movie would work much, much less, you know, as it is. The movie works as a cathartic kind of, um, what's the word again? A vicarious thrill of, uh, excuse me, you know, uh, screwing over your boss in revenge, in retaliation for all the times he screwed over you. That would not work if if we empathize with the, the boss characters, but... So yeah, I, I think they did make the right choice. Now... You know, I... For sure the... If this movie had been made, you know, several decades further back, Dolman's character would have been one of the ones we were supposed to hate. You know, he says that he's going on job interviews because his family says they're going to cut off, you know, they're not going to keep giving him money to live by if he doesn't get a job soon. You know, that would have been like, let's say, let's see, 50s or 60s, I think. Yeah. I, certainly 50s. If this movie had come out in the 50s, Dolman would have been someone that we were supposed to hate with no reservation, and we would probably have been encouraged to think that the rich people and powerful people deserve the power and wealth they have. Now, I first watched this... Yeah, I first reviewed this in 2009. I may have watched it before then. I didn't start writing reviews until 2003. And... I... Let's see... I guess I'll just very briefly... I don't... I almost have to wonder why they even have the racism in the movie. If, if it's been a while since you watched the movie, or you simply don't know what I'm talking about, when Mr. Merchant is preparing sushi, he puts on the, the like something, you know, he, he basically dresses up as a Japanese sushi chef. And he also pronounces some words the way, in, in a way similar to, you know, how Chinese people, if, if a Chinese person hasn't, sorry, Japanese, sorry, Japanese person with an accent might pronounce English words, you know, and it just, like, it's not funny. I guess they were trying to make it offensive, but, like, it's so, like, we're just supposed to be offended 
I mean, it is offensive, but we're they're hoping to get a reaction because he's wearing that and because he runs out of his house wearing that with, with the gun and starts shooting at people. But it's just, it would have been so easy to get rid of. Like, you don't have to make him, you know, aggressively racist to make sure we don't like him. The, you know, we've been given plenty of reason to despise him. Notes taken while watching. We don't realize right away how much of a jerk Rick is being when talking to Sheila in the diner, but, you know, when you think back to it, like, literally every word he says is so obnoxious. You know, he's like, I'm okay with accepting that maybe this is my fault. Aren't you even going to answer me? We've been together for three years, you know. And it's like, accepting it's your fault. You, you're you dumping her because you're sleeping with the tutor that she paid for so that you could get, uh, what's it called? Um, well, a raise, but also like a, what's it called? He got a, a promotion, you know. He wouldn't have been able to get the promotion if she hadn't paid for the tutor. And just, yeah, he's incredibly, yeah. And the, the first real big laugh the movie gets is Sheila finally not being able to take the sound of the hiccup and how much of a jerk Rick is. And, you know, she, she does, in fact, cure the hiccup. She scares the guy after he bet $20 that you couldn't scare away hiccups. And, you know, after she's done that, Rick, I forget if he even said, yeah, I think, like, Rick, you know, stands up and, and, you know, and he's, I think he starts to say her name or something, and she's, she's got his back to him, like, still holding up the guy by, by the, uh, this part, you know, and, and then, she, you know, he, he stands up, says her name, she turns around, just socks him right across, like, like, Captain America, Socking Adolf Hitler's when you just yeah, it's, it's it's yeah, it's very satisfying. Especially, you know, it's it's one of those things where you you only realize exactly how satisfying it was later because she knew all these things, but we didn't know when she punched him. It, we didn't know all the reasons why she punched him. He's screwing the tutor and tutoring the screw. It is pretty fun to, well, it's, it's, it exists that, I'm sorry, I forget the character name, but Ivan Sergei trying desperately to relate to Sheila and cheer her up. Oh, actually, yeah, sorry, after a while, it does start to get a little funny, but, you know, it kind of reminds me of that joke about the guy trying to talk someone out of jumping off a building and... Every single thing he brings up, the guy reveals why that is not a positive for him. I mean, the throwing of the ice cream at the, the you know, the, the boss guy there is a little funny. You know, it's, it's not the worst joke ever. It is too bad that Schmally is such... Ultimately, a fairly inconsequential character because I do like Rachel Lee Cook, and I I think her performance of this is perfectly decent. Like she's, and certainly like her performance in this is very different from some of her other performances. You know, yeah. In general, you know, several of the movies she was in in the '90s and early 2000s. I liked her in them. But ultimately, I mean, her egging Merchant's house and accidentally locking Sheila and Matt, is that his name, out of his car is all she ever does that affects the, the plot at all. I guess, sort of, I, I guess technically, it does affect the plot that she drives Dolman to to the bank in the morning, but, I mean, not really. He ends up getting the job, but that's the closest, yeah. 
It's it's too bad. The bit with the duck walking over the bed sheets with like uh, uh, ink, I guess, on a what are those called? Bit bills? They're not paws. I don't think. Yeah. Anyway, it's a bit telegraphed. Like you know exactly where that's going. And it's kind of weird for such a mild PG-13 to have the, like, you don't see the duck that Merchant shoots and then, like, what, what's it called? Stomps. Like, he, he, he's jumping and stomping this thing into the ground. You don't see it, but the implication is pretty strong. And it's like, why, why is that in this? Like... I could understand if it, like, like, yeah, let's say it was in Road Trip. You know, that's a very, that's a hard R movie. But here, okay, maybe hard R is a little, but it's it's an R-rated movie, and it's never, it never really shies away from doing stuff that's really out there, but, yeah. It is kind of gross how, like, both of the ideas, every single idea that Max comes up with for making money involves tricking girls into sex and or relationships with men. And, yeah, you know, Stu is trying to talk Max out of the, you know, Stu came up with, you know, he, he said, oh, well, you know, technically, if you... You know, if you stole during the weekend and this whole thing, he describes why it would work. And then he's like, but we're not going to do that. And then Max is like, what would we do if we had one shot, one opportunity to make a whole lot of money? Would, you, would we capture it or just let it slip? Like I said, John Cleese is really good at playing, in, in the review, John Cleese is really good at playing obnoxious jerk. The way he talks to Woody Harrelson in the bank, like, okay, let's see, Wood, is that what they're calling it? I'm, I'm sorry, Jason, right? Jason is his character's name. He's maybe being a little goofy, but there's no need to be that rude to him, you know, he's, and that is, like, Cleese absolutely sells that, you know, I've, I've seen some movies where he basically sleepwalks through them, and I don't blame him, they're, he hasn't gotten good material in, an, in a lot of the movies he's been in. He hasn't gotten very good material, and it's it's too bad because he's very very talented. But you know when 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 the, yeah when he and Jason are talking about dog sizes and such, and Jason like he br he brings up you know not, it's not all you know sometimes small animals can actually take out large animals, which is also kind of a weird thing for him to say. He's like a nature lover anyway. Whatever. I guess he's still impressed even though he doesn't like seeing the animals or I don't know anyway the the he's uh, he's basically like saying I saw was it an ant and an ant eater fighting or so I, I don't remember if you know but yeah he's like and uh, you know and and John Cleese is just staring at him well uh, and and the little thing worked one wow that is really, really uninteresting. You know, he, that was that was decent. You know, that was a uh, yeah. And that does right away. You know, we really hate him. He is just we we do not want to see him win in this movie. You know, he's actually probably a well, Rick also. Yeah, he you know Merchant and Rick. We do legitimately like we see them. We loathe them. We enjoy seeing the protagonists win, you know, and, and get Rick fired. Let's see, Merchant, was it all of his money that was in that vault? I mean, certainly, it, it, you know, it's not like he's going to be poor. He can sell his house, for example. But yeah, I guess it was, maybe all, maybe it was all of his, what's the word, Li liquid funds, you know, like, but it, it definitely, it was enough to make him, like, shout no, and that is legitimately kind of, yeah. I think I'm going to go watch, it's been a long time since I watched A Fish Called Wanda, and I'm not going to claim that it's not problematic, 
But I feel like John Cleese is a lot better in that one. In general, the, the they're really good. And yeah, it has been a while since I saw. Now I'm blank. Now I'm even blanking on his name. Um. Okay, so he's yeah, he's in a fish called Wanda. He's in Wild Wild West. Um. Yeah, him. And yeah, I remember him as being legitimately very funny in A Fish Called Wanda. And I'm almost certain Jamie Lee Curtis is basically always funny. When whenever she tries to be funny, she's really, really funny. Anyway. I I like the cut from like Woody Harrelson looks up at the clock. Then you know, first we see his face, you know, my hands are the camera. We see his face looking or sorry what well, yeah whatever looking up then the camera cuts we see the the clock on the wall and then when it cuts back it's not cutting to Woody Harrelson's face but Sheila's face because both of them are carefully checking you know figuring out yeah and Max like enters the bank hey Stu I brought this bag for all the money we can steal. Is this a good time? It's just wow. Again, that is that is a little funny. Like he is he is so psyched to be stealing this money that he's not realizing like if he had if he had gone to a tattoo artist and had the words I am robbing this bank tattooed on his forehead before he walked in the door it still wouldn't be any more obvious that he was there to rob the bank than it already was it's wild but just you know and and he does he does sometimes think quick you know when when Stu is like no it doesn't and and Max is like I'll bring the bag and if, if you know if I can tell you know if, if you tell me it's not a good time to rob Whatever, I'll ask for, I, I, I don't remember what the word is, but, you know, he's, like, saying, I'll just ask what my balance is or something. And we get a POV of Stu going from looking at Max to looking, you know, he he looks to the, the his right and it's like, it would be extremely easy for them to steal right now. No one is there to see, and the reason no one is there to see is because... Jason and Sheila do not want to be there. You know, they, they, yeah. It's hard not to take some pleasure in Rick experiencing several bad things. The diner doesn't have the food he wants. When he's checking out how he looks in the reflection, some teen girls go past him and say, yeah, right. And of course the bank is being robbed. Even before we see Schmally's reaction and and you know, and we see her saying that the tape don't the tapes don't work. The infomercial infomercial is already really ridiculous. They they did a good job on that. Like it's they hit a good balance between we can tell like an actual infomercial is made to make people want to you know like you're you're supposed to be like by the end of an infomercial you're supposed to be eating out of the the presenter's hand you know but with this one we're like oh wow you are. Such an obnoxious a-hole, you know. But it's still, like, it feels like it's been made as an infomercial, even though, you know, it exists only in this film. It's it's there to communicate to us that, the you know, it, it's more effective to see the infomercial. It's, it's more interesting, visually interesting, to see the infomercial and then hear Schmally say that the tapes don't work. Instead of just her saying, I saw this infomercial, but the tapes don't work. I do think there are some good moments in Woody Harrelson's performance. Especially, you know, once he's inside Merchant's house, I think some of that stuff works. Like when he, you know, he's, he's chasing after the doll. Once again, I'm not a fan of the animal abuse, especially since it's being played for laughs here. But... His physical performance is pretty good, and, you know, he, like, I, I do kind of like the, the yeah, just really quickly, because I didn't, I didn't note that joke specifically, but 
Jason has basically given up on being able to get the the key from the dog once the once Itchy and Merchant are running out of the the building chasing Schmally and and Dolman and you know Jason has he's resigned he's like I got beat up and I have nothing to show for it I'm not going to be able to rob and then as he's leaving he spots that the key is down in the in the fountain and it looks like one of those like as um wishing well kind of things you know and and the music that plays and the way it's filmed that that worked you know it's like he made a wish with a in a wishing well well and his wish came true you know and it is like okay yeah i could see that it was on itchy's uh ah, what's it called dog tag but whatever you know it, it was there and he had a violent fight with it which included it being in the fountain the key came loose you know it's yeah i it's it's slightly comically exaggerated but within the world that the movie creates it works and it is kind of funny because we we were like ah he's not gonna get to rob you know because we do really hate merchant he's almost definitely the most obnoxious character in the movie the mo the one we most want to see fail but then the ah, what's the word let's see the the but but yeah you know when when jason hides i don't do we even i don't think we do see where he hides we just see that he runs off to hide somewhere and then merchant comes in and he's like why is my dog wet and then he goes in and he's like cooking and he opens a cupboard. I forget exactly why, but the moment that he opens it, we see, he doesn't see, that Jason is standing there. Just the look on Woody Harrelson's face is legitimately funny. And I th yeah, in part, it's like he's, he's kind of, he's kind of got maybe the crazy eyes, but he also does as, um, Mickey? Mickey and, uh, Mickey and Mallory in, natural born killers you know he's he's got like i'm gonna kill you in his eyes and he's got like a thing that he's gonna try to hit um uh, merchant in the back of the head with but then merchant like turns and so he swings and misses and falls and lands right next to the dog and he's again like trying to get the the key from the dog and then you know merchant realizes that people are egging his house and he freaks out and i mean if you didn't already hate him he goes after two young people who are egging his house and he tries to shoot them that really does you know i'm still not saying it's okay to rob him but he really is yeah he is awful he is 100 percent awful excuse me but yeah some of that did legitimately work some of woody harrelson's performance there and the, the timing and, and such was, was pretty decent, yeah. It is kind of amusing how Stu is basically having a nervous breakdown over the course of the movie from when Max is certain that they should try for stealing money and, you know, and then there at the end, Stu is in therapy, you know. And he, that's, the Paul Costanzo is really good at do, doing that. He does it in this, he does it in Road Trip. And, yeah. So Max is basically always thinking about how to easily have sex with women for himself and guys who will pay him ways he can make money very easily. Like they, they get to the hotel in Vegas and he asks the, like, I forget what those are called, Bell Boy? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but the, the guy who works for the, the, you know, he's asking him, where do we get hookers? You know, I, I don't think that's a great place to ask for that. I think you might be allowed to bring them to your room as long as, like, you're a little subtle about it. But I don't think you should be asking hotel staff, where are some women I can pay to have sex with me? N not even in Vegas. Maybe a motel, but not a hotel. Did Schmally just try to convince Dolman to go egg Merchant's house by saying egg the house in Spanish, which I'm almost like saying the three words egg the house in English, that means something, you know, the, the word egg there is 
ver is a verb, not a noun. But she literally just translates all three words. I'm I'm pretty sure. So let's see. Egg the house. Ah, crap. I swear I won't spend forever trying to remember it. But I, I know the words. Huevos. Yeah, some. Yeah. Huevos el. Ah, what's it? Maison. Or wait, is that French? That's French. Sorry. But yeah, like she. Wow, that is. That is aggressively quirky, but not hugely funny. It is legitimately exciting seeing Itchy Chase and Scare Schmally, Dolm and Sheila, and even Sergei, and then Sheila has 30 seconds to deal with the alarm reset, you know. Yeah, got my, got my heart pumping, and I knew exactly how it was going to end. Excuse me. And Stu is trying to convince Max what they did was wrong, and Max states the thesis of this movie and justification that people have used for breaking the law to get even with the rich. Everyone who's rich has screwed someone over, which, like I said in the review, is 100% true. It feels like our lives were pre-written for us ahead of time, and I get that, but that doesn't make stealing okay. Like, it's it just, it's wild to me that the movie brings something like that up and then it doesn't really say that things should change you know i and ultimately the movie probably is made by people who do ultimately believe in capitalism they just know that a lot of people suffer under capitalism and wish things would change but what if the movie instead of just having this you know brief vicarious cathartic you know thing of of three different groups of people are robbing the bank at the same time and we get to see excuse me the look on Rick's face and Merchant's face when they realize it which is all obviously a huge part of the the thrill of it why not make it like have characters actually do things that would improve lives for other people you know some some take actions that could make people in a strictly capitalist society feel more like the, that what they you know feel them less make them feel less alienated like the movie brings up a huge problem and then doesn't actually try to solve it it just says ah oh, could you imagine if you got super rich i mean and it even acknowledges you know i mean Stu ends up in therapy he's he's extremely and he feels really bad about it. I mean, that's the thing. The movie barely is even saying that it's, you know, that it's a good thing. Like, the um, Jason and the duck go south for winter and haven't been heard from since, you know. And I, I do think Sheila did deserve to get to go to college. And let's see... Uh, what was the other and and Max becomes a blackjack dealer and it's like <sighs> okay to be fair blackjack dealers it's probably not the most incredible job to have in the world but it is still like I'm really I don't think that Max deserved to for for it all to to work out I don't I wouldn't have hated it if he got caught but Stu didn't or something he. He really is very unappealing. I, I really wish that for some reason some people think that it's, you know, he's good at playing unappealing. I get that. So some people think it's that they should run right unappealing stuff for him, like with this movie and like with You Stupid Man. But he was so much funnier in Adam's Family Values. Anyway, now let's see. I mean, I'm not made of stone. Even Sergei and Sheila together are kind of sweet. If I recall, he also had good chemistry with Christina Ricci in The Opposite of Sex. I'm not sure I would say that the the running gag of Dolman talking about whether or not he's cheese ever actually gets funny. 
I mean, it's it's a consistent character trait. He remains the same character. He, he becomes, he takes more charge of his life, but he doesn't stop being who he was at the start of the movie, so that's something at least. And Jason almost walks right into Sheila's feet, so she and Ivan Sergei really did spend all night sleeping under the table. And that is also, I mean, certainly the various people who steal, they do all end up having to, like, you know, they, they, they end up in situations that are awkward or painful or various, you know, they, they do work for it. We are very fortunate, very honored to have people like Stuart Stein, not to mention Marion Crane. I can enjoy some decent inner cutting, such as when Dolman is in the job interview while, you know, Max and Stu are playing roulette and the bank is being robbed with the keys. I've already forgotten. I think it's both Woody Harrelson with his two keys and Sheila with her one key since they're in different rooms. It is legitimately tense when Stu walks up to Rick and he thinks that his robbery was noticed. But then he's told it's the other one. And and you hear the, the heartbeat. Paula Costanzo is really good at seeming extremely anxious. And we see Dolman coming, like we did at the stop, now from Sheila's point of view. And Stu drops the money, but he doesn't get caught stealing. It's, it's a nice little, like, he's really nervous, but that wasn't, like, he didn't get caught stealing money. So it's just... It's, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a relief. You know, they have the release and the relief. And J Jason is called in and he's terrified that he got caught stealing. And Rick keeps trying to hire, or, I, yeah, yeah, hire his replacement. Which I think, I, I haven't been in that situation, but I'm told that is sometimes something you're made to do if you have some sort of, more or less upper tier job and you get fired you have to hire your own replacement and everyone he tries to give a promotion to quits you know Stu, Sheila and Jason and that's like you know it is and it's also really enjoyable to see all three of them say no to his face I mean ultimately Stu wasn't that big of just like Jason was the one who especially hated working there because he was he wasn't being appreciated. His hard work was not paying off. And when he finally did get a raise, it was 15 it was 55 cent an hour. That's ridiculously low. That's nothing. Especially when you look at all the new responsibilities he has. And 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 that again like that is really that brief bit is basically summing up the, the kind of, you know, this is why there are a number of Americans who would love, if they, they would love to be able to steal from their boss and get away with it. Let's see. And, and Sheila hated working there because Rick broke up with her and is her boss, even though they now have a bad interpersonal relationship. I mean, Max says that Stu is always complaining about how boring his job is. So, but but yeah, you know, Stu is relieved that, you know, again, he's not caught and now he can quit the job because he did hate it. And Jason is re relieved at not having get, gotten caught. And he really loves being able to quit and quit to Rick's face. Sheila loves being able to like, she's, you know, he broke up with her, and now she's quitting. Make fondue like old times. Oh, they were fondueing. That sounds mildly dirty, but fondue is just cheese and bread. And Sheila went to UCLA. She majored in economics with a minor in ethics. That's, that's amusing. I, I like that bit. And Rick is so annoyed as he's leaving, but of course... He's going to go tell Dolman there's a job in there for him, and poor Dolman is now stuck with what Jason got at the start. So, good. But the, yeah, 
you know, the, the, and it is like, you know, Rick telling, you know, telling Dolman that he, you know, we're not going to need, you know, he's, he's basically firing him, even though Dolman, like, he's, he's there for the first day on his job, he, he just got hired, he hasn't done any work that, there yet, he hasn't done anything, and Rick is, like, firing him, you know. Now, let's see. Merchant opening his box at the bank and immediately screaming and shutting it again is legitimately funny. It is one of the movie's few laugh out loud moments. And and he, you know, he realizes there's no money, so he shuts it immediately. And then he's like, wait, what? And he opens it, and there's the, the little paper with now we're even and the, the footprint, bill print, whatever. No, wait, bill, that's the, that's the, Mouth thing, whatever. Yeah, the the print from that from the duck that is a legitimately kind of that's you know that's the very last thing we see, and that is yeah a little a little funny as a yeah. Now yeah, I think that. It, so yeah, the without end credits, it's an hour twenty five and a half minutes long. With end credits, it's an hour. It's an hour and a half. Sorry, wait. It's an hour thirty minutes and thirty seconds long. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken. before watching. Let's see. Let's see. Um, hmm. Yeah, like I mentioned, you know, yeah, let me just briefly, I have written down here what I've seen. Let's see, Alicia Silverstone, I watched Excess Baggage. I watched Batman and Robin. I thought she did fine in those. They're not good movies as such, but you know, she's she's not bad. And Rachel Lee Cook. Again, the 2000 Get Carter movie is a bad movie. She's perfectly decent in it. Let's see. Yeah, and you know, to me, Woody Harrelson first and foremost is Hamish Hamish Abernathy. But he is also great in the Zombieland movies. Scanner Darkly, obviously. Austin Powers, Thin Red Lion, Larry Flint, Money Train, Natural Born Heroes, and Indecent Proposal. And John Cleese, I mean, to me, he's... When I think of John Cleese, I think of Monty Python. But he's also great in Shrek 2. I mean, Charlie's Angels full throttle. He's perfectly fine in that. You know, it's not that great of a movie. He's okay in The Adventures of Pluto Nash. George of the Jungle. I forget if he's good in that. Fierce Creatures. He's good. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. One of his rare, not funny roles. For a while, I wasn't even sure that really was him. But I've since went on, you know, I went on IMDb. It's him. It actually is him, even though he's not funny in the movie, which, you know, it's not a funny movie. Splitting Airs, he's pretty decent in. Fish Called Wanda. Yellowbeard, Meaning of Life, Private Tom Parade, Time Bandits, Life of Brian Holy Grail. But yeah, Paul Costanzo, apparently he's in 40 Days and 40 Nights. I don't, I, um, I remember almost nothing about that movie. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the the music, John Frizzle also played for Ghost Ship, 13 Ghost Ships, and Ghost Gats, Human Tangle, Office Space, Good Morning, Just Last Summer, Mafia, In the Resurrection, Dante's Peak. Now. So, yeah. The. Actually, yeah, I guess. I'm not sure I have that much left to say about this thing. I mean, you know, the, the workers hate their job and their boss. And want to 
steal the the American dream. Actually, yeah, I guess I did say everything in the say say uh, section before this one. You know, notes taken while watching. So if you skipped ahead to this section to hear me say more about it, I'm I'm afraid I'm gonna have to send you back to the other one. I I don't, I don't know what to tell you. This is information retrieval, not information. What's it called again? Disbursement. I. I, when you find a way to reference Brazil, you know it's been a pretty good day. So yeah, the trailer, you know, I, I look for, I, I always try to find, a, you know, a bunch of videos for these movies before I do a video on them myself. This one, the only thing I could find, you know, there, there are things that you can find if you, you know, search YouTube for Scorched, but it's not this. You know, almost none of it is. I, I mean, yeah, you can find a few clips and then the trailer and such, but there's like there's no discussion, there's no reviews of it or anything. The trailers, it's pretty good, represents it pretty well. Although identifying Vegas as an obstacle rather than a help is a tad of a reach. They just didn't want to break the format and wanted to tell the viewers that the movie has characters in Vegas. The trailer also makes it seem like Max and Stu lose in Vegas. Although to be fair, the movie also makes it look like they do. But yeah, it's, you know, I wonder, like, when when the producers looked at how poorly the movie did, I have to imagine they were probably thinking, we had our, we filmed in Vegas, and we lost a lot of money on this movie. Could, could we not have just, like, hypothetically, they didn't have to go to Vegas, like, it could have been, like, they could have done a lock, stock, smoking barrel thing with a local gambling kind of thing, you know. But no, they had to go to Vegas, and they lost a ton of money on the movie, and just, yeah. I think I read somewhere that the reason the mo movie did so poorly was because it came out right around the same time as something insanely popular, and that just sucked all the air out of the room, and that's too bad, you know, you can't. Excuse me, if I had watched, excuse me, if I had seen the trailer, watched the trailer for this movie, back when it first came out, I might have watched it in the movie theater based on the trailer, you know, so I could imagine that at least some people did, uh, yeah. Anyway, that was a short section. Moving on to the final. And one, excuse me, I need to fix this real quick. Critic sites, IMDb, and Wikipedia. So I noted 45 different things that I wanted to bring up. So here we go. Yeah, so this is the, hmm, it must be, yeah, this is the, the Rotten Tomatoes critic quote. Screenwriter Joe Wine has smartly wired these three bizarre personal stories into a raucously satisfying triumph of good over evil. The comedy is extremely broad, and there's this, I guess that was the one positive review that the movie got on, on Rotten Tomatoes, of the six, you know. The comedy is extremely broad, and there's a slight air of desperation to the whole thing, as if the film is trying too hard to be quirky and likable. Yeah, very much so. It feels completely pointless, despite some entertaining sequences and gifted performers. The word quirky should be stricken from the English language if Hollywood doesn't stop churning out comedic romps that try too hard. And yeah, so here are some Rotten Tomatoes user reviews. The intertwined plot has been done a million times, but never fails to entertain. Not the greatest movie, but does manage to get a few lives and smiles, laughs and smiles. Did I say Lyles and Smaps? Okay, I can live with that, even though the ending falls short in many ways. Goofy, but also very entertaining. Artistically speaking, I like the split screen scenes. Now, let's see. 
three employees, a bank manager who is a moron, and a bank with no cameras, all the ingredients for a bank heist gone right. Now, let's see. Yeah, and so, so some stuff from IMDb, as usual, the taglines. How many tellers does it take to rob a bank? Not shaken, not stirred, but scorched. To break in, uh, so, to break out, you gotta break in. And, let's see. Yeah, this was a, a decent point. This is a continuity goof. As Sheila enters the bank with Mark on Saturday, you see the bank's hours posted on the door as Monday, Thursday, Friday, See, and we yeah, have no mention of Saturday, so presumably the bank does not open on Saturdays. However, key plot points take place on Saturday with the bank open. That's, yeah, they, they ah, what's it called? They overlooked that in, in you know, obviously they should have, they, they should have put text on the, you know, on the, on the doors that, that said that it was open on Saturdays. And, yeah, I'm just briefly going to go over these because they're slightly amusing. This is under the section Crazy Credits. Alicia Silverstone names Alicia Silverstone's name appears in the form of a tattoo. Rachel A. Cook's, Lee Cook's name appears in the form of a billboard for, dungeon, for a Dungeons & Dragons-based golf club. Woody Harrelson's name appears as a plate along the road. John Cleese's name appears written in the back of a truck. Now, let's see the... Okay, so that brings us... Yeah, so these are the... This is the... Yeah, these are the reviews I found via the titles IMDb External Reviews section. There were 17 total. I copied in six, so the rest are dead links, languages I don't speak, that kind of thing. Everyone's looking for payback at Scorched, and you will too if you waste your well-earned on this tepid revenge farce. The multi-stranded but undercooked plot sees three disgruntled bank tellers, Alicia Silverstone, Woody Harrelson, and Paul Costanzo, separately deciding to knock off their workplace on, workplace on the same weekend. Predictably, these plans are subject to all manner of mishaps. Alas, the attempts of zany humor turn pear-shaped too. While Fat Cat John Cleese slices the ham thick. That's a good way to phrase that. Most of the cast plod through like it's another day at the office. Yeah. And... Yeah, here's one that did like it. And... There is no reason why this should be such an unmitigated disaster. The plot has promised, the actors have formed, the location is small town deserty. The blame must lie with director Gavin Grazer and writer Joe Wiley. Let's see. Yeah, so that brings us to the IMDb user reviews. Normally, I copy in the 100 top most, you know, the, the top 100 most useful voted out of however many there are total, but this one only had 31, so I copied in all of them. That's, even I think that more than 31, and one of them's me, you know, 30 other people watched this movie and decided to write on it. Like, it doesn't cost any money. And if you can write a review pretty quick, it barely, it's barely an investment of time, but almost no one, like, ultimately thousands of people have watched this and voted for it on IMDb, but almost no one cared enough, whether dislike or like, to even write a re 31 people total, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so this is a review that th this person did like it and wrote a positive review and wrote 
and and 11 out of 12 people found it helpful let's see but yeah some of them don't this this person gave it 6 out of 10 other 6 out of 10 is okay yeah several 4 out of 10 Yeah, this person, uh, you know, Woody Harrelson's attempt at slapstick comedy is just plain goofy. Rachel Lee Cook's, sorry, Rachel Lee Cook overdoes her performance by exaggerating her facial expressions and motorcycle rebel character. Re rebel character, sorry. Paula Costanzo was like Jerry Fine Flat Seinfeld. Trying to be serious. I have to admit, it's been a long time since I watched a Seinfeld performance, but yeah, could be. But this person gave it a 9 out of 10. Now, huh, this person gave it a 1 out of 10. One person wrote a negative review with the title, I'd Rather Burn. That is, yeah, ouch. Literally. Presumably he wouldn't literally prefer to burn. Mm. This person gave it a 1 out of 10. Their subject line is, no, just no. Their username is stuff that needs my email, and they wrote, "Oh, it was yeah, it was a year and a half ago, basically that they watched this and or wrote this review." Bad in every way, unfunny, stilted, and clumsy. Had to register to this site after using for years just to write this review. That is, yeah. And. A very amusing comedy of errors farce. That is a good way to. Yeah, and yeah, this person points out not so laudably. However, it romanticizes the idea of robbery, even though the point is more about settling scores and taking risks. In general, it tends to make the lesser argument seem the better by blurring the ethical questions. And. For example, what is the difference between moral versus legal theft? If someone amasses a fortune through legal thievery, exploiting the desperate by selling them false dreams, is it therefore justifiable for the victims to steal from the perpetrator on moral grounds? In other words, are there any circumstances under which thievery, as defined by law, can be justified for other than legal reasons. Unfortunately, when we look for exceptions to excuse criminal behavior, we can always find them, and then we are faced with the dilemma of determining which is ultimately wrong. The film does not address such implications. Rather, it merely assumes that robbery can be justified under certain conditions, and then attempts to provide them. Evidently, robbery is okay as a means to get even with a false lover or to break away from the prison of conventional values to realize one's dreams or to seek vengeance against the thievery of the more legal variety. But while the moral ambiguities of this film are regrettable, the situations faced by the characters are too absurd to be taken seriously, and hence it succeeds as a farce. In reality, only a certifiable moron would conclude this film was actually trying to promote robbery as an excusable act. It's just that morons aren't as rare as they used to be. I don't know why only one out of six people... Well, I guess, yeah. One out of six people found it helpful. I guess if you're talking about is it a good movie, 
not that much of the review is focused on that. I I guess that's why not very many people. And maybe people thought that he was reading too much into it, but I do think like it is kind of the fact that this is a movie. I mean, it's not was it an indie movie? I mean, certainly it attracted a lot of talent. You know, uh, some of these people are not big names anymore. But in 2003, Alicia Silverstone, Rachel Lee Cook, and maybe also even Sir Guy, you know, some of these people were big names. And they were willing to bet their reputation that people wouldn't picket the movie theater, that it wouldn't get banned, or, to, you know, it could have. I mean, people's careers have gotten ruined over movies that performed poorly, and a lot of those movies performed poorly just because they weren't that good, not because they kind of try to make, you know, make excuses for robbing a bank, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, certainly when, you know, there, there are movies that try to tackle the ethical issues of this, you know, like, for sure, a movie like Fight Club talks about, you know, are, is it okay to try to get revenge on rich people in capitalist societies if you've been, you know, if you have a lousy job and they take advantage of you, but that movie isn't just, like, you know, that, there, I know, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, if you go back and watch that movie, it's nowhere near as good as you remember it. I don't read it as, I, the, the way I see it, it's making fun of the kind of person that it's, you know, the, the, the surface level appeal of Fight Club, the movie Fight Club is making fun of those people, you know, the, the, it's, the movie Fight Club is not saying you should do Fight Club and Project Mayhem or anything like that, it's saying that there are a number of people who would be won over by the rhetoric in, in the movie, you know. So it's not impossible to, to, that movie does explore how far, you know, if, if you, if you push workers far enough in a capitalist society, will they eventually rebel and how far are they willing to go? Those are the kinds of things that that movie explores. And here, they're just like, well, everybody hates their boss in America. I'm sure we can get, you know, plenty of people to watch. I mean, I'll, I'll real quick find, because I'm almost certain that the, I copied in the, let's see. Yeah, so if we go to the Wikipedia, I'm, I hope I'm not making the camera bounce too much. Let's see. It had a budget of seven million, and only it earned less than three hundred thousand dollars. A budget of seven million. Let's say. Let's say that. A theater ticket is eight dollars. That means they had to get at least a million Americans to watch this movie, and they assumed that they would be able to find at least a million people in America willing to spend eight dollars for the vicarious thrill of the the robbery. That that you know yeah. Uh, yeah, who who were comfortable with the idea of because because it's right there in the trailer. You know, the trailer doesn't make it out like they're you know making the world a better place. It's just they're getting even, and yeah, they they thought and I don't know. I guess maybe they were. I yeah. I I'm not one hundred percent certain why the movie did fail, but I yeah. Anyway. It is a movie that basically takes for granted that a lot of Americans hate their job to the extent where they're okay with the idea of someone robbing a bank to get even with the, yeah, the, the bank, let's see, I guess, was he the manager assistant? No, Jason was becoming the assistant, I, I don't remember exactly, but yeah, I just, I think that's noteworthy that 
so many people were so convinced, you know, seven million dollars worth of they were convinced that people would be fine with it and I mean I've never heard of this movie being like like yeah when when I looked up stuff about it I didn't find like I said the the six external reviews don't even mention the ethical idea and only one of the 31 I think it was only one of 31 excuse me oh wait there it is um hmm. yeah of the 31 IMDb user reviews only one person even brings up the ethical implications and you know ultimately he says the movie isn't telling the the movie isn't saying that it's okay to go out and do what happens in the movie but nobody else even feels the need to say of course it's not okay to rob a movie, but I like the movie, or of course it's not okay to rob a, movie, rob a bank, but I hate the movie, you know. Most people didn't even, and again, I realized, you know, okay, so it's 30 people writing reviews, and it's six of the online, you know, but yeah. The, the, the idea that robbing a bank to get even, and, and to get out of poverty, it, yeah, they were they were so convinced that it wouldn't and yeah, I just, I just think that's noteworthy and this is for by my standards this is a very short movie sort of the video for me that short video of me talking about a movie but I realize for many people this is obscenely long so if you stayed this long I want to thank you for that and I hope you'll come back next week. I hope you enjoy watching and bleh. wow I am tripping all over my words today like okay here we go one more try I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording and I'll catch you next time